All right, welcome, welcome to uh, week five of reproducible research in R, a course being taught um, partially openly available on YouTube, this lecture series here, and sort of partially um, at Louisiana State University. Um, so I'm Ted Dallas, uh, an assistant professor at LSU. Um, and today we'll be learning about data manipulation. And so in week three, we went over um, the basics of R in addition to some like conditionals and sort of how to start subsetting data and the different data structures. And today I'd like to dive deeper into data manipulation in R. Um, I don't think we have any housekeeping things. And so I think without further ado, I'll dive right in. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. All right. And so we have the familiar um, R Studio window open on the left. And my lecture notes in um, an R Markdown document on the right. The reading for this week for people who are in the class or who just want to sort of follow along and read um, alongside the class is um, a chapter in Hadley Wickham's book, R for Data Science, and it's chapter 12, which goes over concepts of tidy data. And so there's a lot of higher level things about data structures that we won't really go over in this class. And that sort of starts, that chapter starts to get into some of them. Um, and so as of yet, we really have focused, we haven't read in any outside data, right? So when we first learned R in week three, um, we built our own data using the sort of probabilistic um, random variable functions in R, like R P O I S, which stands for like it draws um, randomly from a Poisson distribution, R unif is a popular one that I use a lot because it's just it random draws from uniform distribution. <clears throat> and then uh, maybe we also saw our binome or one of the other sort of um, uh, our probability distribution function um, things. But yeah, we won't go into too much detail on those either, but those are incredibly useful um, as you get deeper and deeper, especially in, in terms of simulation uh, and fitting procedures. But here the focus is on data. And so I'm still actually not going to read in data like the classic like read CSV, which I mentioned briefly. And so if you have data locally, you can use read CSV and then just hand it the path to the data. So path to, I'm typing the RStudio um, instance now. And then you hand it a separator value. And so comma, uh, CSV stands for comma separated values. TSV stands for tab separated values, which is just a way to store the data. What's nice about that from a reproduci reproducibility perspective is that the format is really clear. Like it's always just, it can be read by pretty much like a G edit, which is my text editor on the right there, or GIMP or Emacs or anything, could read a CSV file or a TSV file. You know, what it couldn't read is an XLS file or XLSX file. And that's because Microsoft follows a little bit of different conventions um, when it comes to data structures because they add on that layer of, um, of being able to like embed plots and, and all that garbage. And so it's not really as clear and pure as, as a CSV or TSV. I shouldn't say pure, it's not pure, but yeah, it's not as, it's not as transparent as um, TSV or CSV files. Regardless, we're still actually not going to read in local data either. I'm going to pull in data from the web and then we're gonna use that to look at data, data, data cleaning and, and data manipulation techniques. And so here I talk about a little bit about um, differences between data cleaning or sometimes people call it data munging, I don't know. I, I, I like to just keep data cleaning, data manipulation. And in my mind, data cleaning is sort of the formatting of data um, to best suit your analytical needs. So if I have a date column, formatting that column as a date and making sure that R understands or whatever programming language you're working in, 
understands that that column corresponds to a date is important. And that's data cleaning in my mind. Data manipulation comes when you start cutting out rows, when you start cutting out columns or adding new columns, manipulating the data, the actual sort of physical, not physical, the data structure itself. Um, yeah, so then I talked about R packages. I'm not sure if we've used any R packages as of late, apart from those that are that ship with base. So base R consists of stats, base, is there a package called base? Let's find out. We can use session info to find out and see what's attached. Oh yeah, I should know that. So the attached packages are stats, graphics, um, and utils, as well as base. And those are the main ones is honestly stats, graphics, and utils, I think. But, and there's tons of functionality there that I actually didn't go into in, in the introductory lecture, like changing things to lowercase and spell checking and just oh, there's tons of other things. And it's also important to note that many or that much of the functionality that I'll go into when now we use our packages, because I'm going to sort of teach um, two of, of have these little dream childs, which are um, plier and dplyr in this lecture. Um, that much of that functionality could be done in base. It's just a little more clunky to do in base, right? And so I think the point of, of have these packages is not to, to create some new thing, but just to, as he says in his talk sometimes, to help people fall into a pit of success. Though later we might see that that is a pit of dependency hell if you've ever tried to install packages Tidyverse, which is ridiculous. It's a complex web of interrelated packages and many, many dependencies that we'll go over later. So a fantastic sort of package ecosystem, but it doesn't come without its, um, its issues, sort of inherent issues. I'm gonna just look, read the notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so we really want to keep packages to a minimum, which is what I've tried to do. Um, I think throughout the course, I maybe use a total of around five packages on top of the sort of base packages. Hopefully less than that, but I'm not sure actually. Um, because the idea is that with each additional package or dependency, you sort of maybe limit reproducibility because all of a sudden you have that dangling thing. And so if Hadley just all of a sudden shut down the tidyverse and was like, nah, like, or made some really drastic change that didn't have backward or reverse compatibility, there'd be a lot of upset our users. Uh, it'd be bad. So <laughs> yeah, packages in general will get you sometimes. All right, so let's dive in to the, uh, the concepts here. And so I went over read CSV briefly above by example. There's another function that's really um, helpful when reading in data that isn't formatted um, or you, when you don't wanna sort of set the, the separator uh, and that's read delim. And so you can look up the, the help file on that and see it offers a lot of flexibility just as read CSV does. And so that's comes from, from the utils package there we go. And so it's in the same help file as read CSV, read table, and there's read delim. But you still hand it a separator. It defaults to a tab character. So it's actually really quite similar to read CSV, as you can see, except the default separator is different. That's it. I mean, it might actually treat it just the same. So this might actually be the same as read CSV with a um, setting the separator to a tab character. So let's read that in to our, our studio instance. And what it's doing is actually just, it's pulling from a website. And the website that it's pulling from is uh, Jenny Bryan's um, Gapminder data. And so some of this uh, lecture sort of uh, was inspired by some of her work. Um, and I link to here. So definitely check her out. She's a fantastic resource, really amazing. 
Um, never met her in person, but really cool. Um, all right, so now we read in the, da the data file from the web. It's my cat Brody, she's helping out, helping me read data. I'm gonna set her down now, actually. Oh, she likes to be part of it, but she's in the way of my keyboard. So she's probably just gonna jump right back up here. So that's gonna be, it's gonna be a thing. <laughs> All right, so now we have our, our DAT object. So we've stored this data as DAT and we can look at different things about it. For instance, we can look at the dimensions of it, which is the number of rows and the number of columns. And so this is Gapminder data, which gives information on life expectancy and other things per country. And we can view the other things by, the, uh, by using head. And so that prints the first six lines. And so it gives information on country, the year that the sort of data corresponds to, population size, what continent's on, life expectancy in terms of years, and then per capita GDP. Through gross domestic, gross domestic product, is that right? I don't know, measure of economic stuff, doesn't matter. Um, and so we have the data and, and I, you have a sort of arsenal of tools from um, the intro stats or intro R, not intro stats, intro to our lecture um, to start understanding these data. And so we went over some summary functions such as the mean, and we can look at mean of certain columns. And so here, because the structure of that should be a data frame, which it is, which is just a list of vectors, we can index the vectors by their name. And so we can say, if we wanna figure out the mean life expectancy, we would say mean dat dollar sign life exp, which is the name of that column. And we can see that across all years and all countries, the mean life expectancy is 59.47. But there's often times where we don't wanna do that, right? Why, why would we care about the mean life expectancy when there's different numbers of years and different numbers of, of countries that like we, we typically would want more specific information on that. And we can view the sort of different um, distribution of data among countries by saying table.country, and it has the counts per country. And actually, all countries are, are equal there. So all have values of 12, which is nice. I didn't actually realize that. And so that means that each country is represented by 12 instances or 12 years of data. All right. But we still, like, you typically wouldn't say like, what's the mean life expectancy for this group of countries? And so we may wanna subset down to one country or um, narrow our gap in sort of the temporal um, scale and say well, a subset of years. And so here I use two things that we learned in the introduction to our um, tutorial. I use a which function and I use this conditional. So remember this conditional means um, is equal to. And so it, it evaluates to true or false where this is being compared. So that country, the vector is being compared against this value, Afghanistan. So it's saying um, this will be a vector of the number of rows that I have in my data that is true, and or, true or false with all values of Afghanistan being true, which I guess is this, these first 12 values and all of the other values being false. And I can use the which function to get at the actual indices themselves. And we see, so we say which, and we say which are true. So it defaults to saying like, what is true in this um, statement? and it gives me the indices. And I don't even think that is strictly necessary. I think if you delete which, it will actually output the same thing here. And it does. Which is, in my opinion, a sort of nice thing to have in there, but not strictly necessary. And as we get into um, the use of plier and dplyr, you'll actually see that there are many, many, many different ways to subset data in R. And so here I'm using perhaps the most like low level 
if you can say that way. Um, but there's also uh, arguments like subset or aggregate that are still in uh, what I believe is base, maybe utils. No, it's in base. Um, so here it gives information on package name. Um, that, yeah, many different ways to do things here. So I can do the same thing. So here we, we subset data um, just to Afghanistan, right? So if we wanted to say the find out mean life ex expectancy for somebody in Afghanistan in these years or across these years, um, I could subset the data and then calculate the mean of this column, life exp. And then if I want to say, sort of regardless of country, you have subset to all data before 1960. I can do that as well using this. So I say dat, and then I have the indexing again. So the square brackets that index rows in the data frame. And I say the which, and the, I'm gonna highlight that, which year is less than 1960. So we learned that less than is also, is a, a still outputs to Boolean, so outputs to true or false. And you can also use something like less than or equal to if we want to include 1960. We would say greater than or equal to if we want to um, have everything from 1960 till the most recent time. There's a lot of nice things that we can do. And so there we see this gives us much more data. This gives us around 284 rows of data. We can view the head of that, which is the first six lines. And we see there's only two instances from Afghanistan that are post 19, or sorry, that are prior to 1960. Um, and two from Albania, two from Algeria. It's likely the same years that were sort of sampled across all the countries. <clears throat> Um, but we could sort of do the same thing with a bunch of other different sort of tools. And so to show the sort of uh, built-in redundancy, if you can call it that, we can use the subset function. And so the subset function first takes information on the data structure itself. And so we subset is in base, and we, we hand it our data frame, which we call dat, and then we give it a condition. And the condition um, is basically the same thing that we gave right here. So the condition should be a vector that evaluates to true or false. That is the same number of rows that are in DAT. And typically we get that by making some call to DAT. And so here that should be, we say DAT year is less than 1960, which should be the same exact thing as which DAT year less than 1960 as we did above. And we can look at the head like we did before. And yeah, it looks like it pulled the same data. And that's good. Um, what's nice about the subset function is it has some built-in functionality or flexibility to um, automatically subset columns and things like that. So what's, let's say we only want these two final columns, life expectancy and GDP per capita and we want to uh, subset the data. So we use subset, we have the data frame, and we want to subset to all years prior to 1955. So we say dat year is less than 1955. And then we can use the select argument to the function. And then we hand it the names of the columns that we want. For um, and select is nice, and you'll see this verb elsewhere. You'll see this verb when we start getting into um, plier and dplyr syntax. And I think it inherits from SQL or SQL. Some people say SQL, some people say SQL. Um, but that's not a hero right there. It may just be like before that, or I don't know. And so we can look at that. So prior to 1955, we have uh, what's a dim on that? 142. All right. Just gonna do a sense check. All right, yeah. For some reason, I, I was doubting it. So we know that the dim of 
of the faith prior to 1960, all faith prior to 1960, are bigger than that prior to 1955, which makes sense. And now we've selected only those two columns, um, those two final columns, life expectancy and GDP per capita. And this is the exact same thing as if you use sort of standard R subsetting. Right, so I'm gonna go, okay, so that is the command to do that, right? Where I just select those two. But we could do the same thing if we say that which year, oops, sorry, is less than hand of the same. And then remember the subsetting is this first part subsets rows and after the comma subsets columns. So here we can just put in the names of the columns however, as a vector using the concatenate or C function. And then we have to hand it the vector names as character strings. And it's the same thing. We can also hand it the actual indices, right? And so instead of handing it the names, we could hand it what I think maybe columns five and six, I'm guessing here. Is that right? I don't think that is. Is it? Yeah, it is. Okay, sweet. Yeah, we can also hand it the indices five and six, but that's bad practice. That's called hard coding, which we actually want to avoid. Because if we if we added a column, all of a sudden the indexing, if we hard coded it, could shift and be off, and we could be making an actual error and not know it. Whereas if we specify the name of the column here, it gets around a little bit of that um, that trouble. All right, and then we go over in the notes a little bit about sort of a refresh on conditionals, but I sort of already went over that a little bit. We got um, is equal to, we got less than, less than or equal to. Um, I think some of my favorite are the ones that you can start using not, which not is exclamation mark. Um, so not equal to, and you say like one is not equal to, Two, and they'll probably say true because that's that is true. But meanwhile, one is not equal to one is false, which is the same thing as saying one is equal to one is true. If that is hopefully less confusing than it sounds as I'm saying it, um, but it's super useful. Uh, Additionally, we can string conditionals together, which is something we haven't gone over, but is really useful for data manipulation. And so what if we want to take our dat and we want to, let's look at that header really quick. Um, we want to subset it based on the country being Afghanistan and another condition. So the year being less than 1960. And so, uh, that's like basically two things that we specified before. And so we're up here, um, where we specify each separately, if you can read that small text. I'll try to um, make that text bigger before next class. But I'll type it into our studio as well. And so we have dat, and we specify our which, and we say which dat country is equal to Afghanistan, and that gives us those. But we want a second thing. And the second thing comes from using the AND operator. And so the AND operator is a way of saying, this has to be true as well as this other thing. Um, and dat country, uh, oh, sorry, no, dat year is less than 1960. And there you go. So it filters based on two things. It filters based on country and it filters based on year. Um, another useful subsetter is the OR operator. And so this is like, what if I want, this is an odd example so going from this, but what if I want um, all of Afghanistan and, or, like, or any country before that uh, sampled before 1960? What the result of that would be, would be it would include um, Afghanistan years 1952 to whatever the most recent year is sampled, um, and all countries with years prior to 1960. I think that's right. We'll look at it and say that's right, or and see if that's right. 
Okay, so we can see the head of this. We use that or, that pipe symbol, or that, that vertical line symbol. I'm used to calling it a pipe for reasons that we won't go into. Let's see the first 13 lines of that. So it gives us all of Afghanistan, which we sort of were expecting, that's good. And now let's see the first 20 lines, and we see that it doesn't give us any other dates past 1960, except those for Afghanistan. That's an odd example of the use of or. Um, it can be uh, a really, really useful operator, um, but this just isn't the, 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 the use case for it typically. Uh, and then lastly, I think we might have gone over the use of in, but if not, um, I go into more detail in this lecture. Um, and in is really good um, for allowing a vector of possibilities. Um, so if I wanted to pull data from, um, I won't even go into, I know I go into example here, um, but basically what if you wanted more than one condition met? Like I want data from Asia as well as Europe. You can't say that using this traditional double equal sign. Um, you would have to use the in operator. All right. And so I go over here, I go over my clear the workspace. That's not how you clear it. I'm, I'm, like, I'm so used to just working in the terminal. I'm sorry, that's a terminal command. And I'm just silly. I actually don't even know how to clear an hour. There's, there's probably a way. I'll just hit enter a bunch of times. This is a good lecture. <laughs> so we can use um, this not character combined with one of our other functions that, that outputs as a conditional. So remember we went over is NA. And so here um, we can subset and say we don't want, hope that, well, hope that is email notification. Hope we can subset all the data that is not equal to NA. And that's really useful. And so we can get that in there. Let's see the dim on that. 1704, cool. Um, that's almost the same thing as removing rows. So you can remove rows with the minus symbol. So if we want to say, let's, I, I no longer like that first row. And so we'll find the, the dim of that, and then let's remove the first row. And so that just looks like minus one. I give the index of the first row, and let's see the dim of that, and it says 1703 rows. So I removed that row. Removing things is generally bad practice relative to subsetting things based on um, a not or something like that or another filter command. And the reason for this is going to um, become obvious when I run this command. And so if I say minus is NA, it gives me an empty data frame. And that's because there are no NAs in that. And so when I use minus is NA, let me can look at this. So let's just look at is NA, they're all false. Minus is an A are all zero. I don't actually know why it airs out functionally, but, or why it removes all of that. Um, and why is an A and minus is an A is the same thing. So the camera's shaking because the cat has decided that she wants to run around and jump on the desk and such. She's a good cat. Uh, but yeah, and so we can further evaluate the sort of differences between them using a previous function that we went over called all, um, which would evaluate if these two things are actually equal in structure. And if it will air out and say, no, like you can't even compare these two because they're only comparable for equal sized data frames. We could also say like all n row of this is compared to n row of this, just to see if they have the same number of rows and that would also be false. But there we wouldn't need an all statement. We could just say n row of subsetted dat, which I'm just going to pseudocode as dat1, equal to n row of dat2, which is just pseudocode for this second subset 
of data a year. So hopefully that, that helps clarify some things. Oh, nice. I got a little ahead of myself. So now this is using the at or the or statements in the lecture notes to look at. So this would mean I want to subset the data, which um, the country is Afghanistan and the year is equal to 1977. So this will only return one row of data corresponding to um, the country of Afghanistan and the year of 1977. And meanwhile, this will return data which um, life, expect life expectancy is below 40 or that which GDP per capita is less than 500. Either or, so it'll be both of those things. Or, yeah, one of those conditions has to be satisfied. That is a better way to put it. All right, and so now I'll, uh, I briefly mentioned the use of the in operator relative, especially if you wanted to index by multiple things. And so here we can see that. And so let's try to use our sort of classic double equals sign on this. And so we want to, here we want to subset countries to only look at Afghanistan and Turkey. And we run that and we notice it has a really weird dimension because we looked before and we saw that there were 12 entries per country. And yet we see now, and there's only 12 entries total split between those two countries. And that's not what we want. And that's because this, uh, the double equal sign works only if there's only one element at the end here. If you come on to compare a vector to a vector, it is better to use the in operand, operand operator. And so we see there that now it gives us 12 entries per um, each country and a total of uh, 24 rows and six columns. And so we could also use this function, which is in base or in utils. You can look, it's in base. It's called match. It's really, really useful when handing um, arguments to a function and writing really clear functions. It's also good for subsetting data. And so here it's basically the same thing as we wrote previously. We want to match, we, find, we want to find all matches of this vector which is of any element of this vector, which is Afghanistan and Turkey in that country. So I'm going to copy and paste this over. And that's what this looks like. If we couldn't see it in the smaller side of the screen, I'm using match here, handing it a vector of two values containing the countries of interest that I want to subset to, and then all of the countries. Yeah, what I do? Oh, because match only finds the unique values. So let's see, see. Yeah, so that, that corresponds to the first values where it's found. So that was my mistake. That's why match is really good in functions. And so you can imagine a case where you want to hand a function, um, some argument that needs to be matched to either a separate function or yeah, sometimes a function or um, or something else. I'm trying to think of what I've used match for in the past. I don't know. We'll go into the details of match now. You can tell I only cursorily read the lecture notes before I'm giving the lecture, so you're getting it here. Um, and so how match works is it compares the first element to the second vector. And so it's saying what index of the second vector is this first argument found in? I think I said that right. However, it only gives one value. It gives the first instance. And so it's good if you hand it, um, if the second vector is a vector of unique values, right? And so here, our DAT country were non-unique values. In this example, where I say match dog to dog, cat, snake, it gives me a unique, this the second vector is a vector of unique values. And we can see this if we add a second dog, and all of a sudden we have dog as a non-unique value. And we want to find 
we want to match dog to this vector and it only gives us the first instance. Likely more computationally efficient, but we need to operate it on unique values um, or vectors of unique values. We can use match by handing it the first argument as a vector and the second argument as the thing to be matched to. And what that will look like, I'm gonna copy it over and hopefully not an enter. Okay. And what that will look like, so this is the same example as above, the output of match will be whatever length the first argument is to match. So here, the first argument, or previously, the first argument was length one. Um, it was just match dog. Um, and we can look at that if we, all right. Let's add another thing to it. Cow. Oops, what did I do? I know I'm going crazy. I don't see. Oh, there it is. I do. I forgot that little. You gotta specify your uh, strings. Um, yeah, and so here it's the second element in that vector. Just doing a little sense check for myself here, actually. Um, and so now, so it'll always be of length of the first one. And here the dog first appears in the second element of the vector that's handed to it. But now I want to hand it, I want dog, dog. So now I want to hand it this, where we'd hand it a vector as the first argument and it, and it identifies all <clears throat> um, entries of the vector that are equal to, so double equals to this second argument, which is dog. And it will be of length four. And the other values are NA. So it tells me one, one. And then we can hand it other things like that, which means, so we're comparing this, these two values, dog and cat, to this vector of values containing dog, cat, snake, and dog. So up here, we find that dog, which is the first thing in a vector length one, is one, one, and the output is length four. And here we say like, it's basically the same thing as an in operator. Um, and so we still wanna say like, where are dog and cat? And we see dog is in spot one, but now cat here is in index two. So what would actually that look like if I just did, if we just gave the in? Oh yeah, so it wouldn't tell me, yeah, match is a little bit more clean there. So it, match provides the actual index corresponding here and in just says, yeah, it's either a dog or a cat. I don't know which one, but you're fine. It's still of length four, um, and so that first argument is important. Uh, now I go over a little bit about do call and reduce. I really waffled on even going into it. So do call as a function wasn't even something that I used until like mid PhD. It's useful, but like there's there are tons of ways around it and around it. Um, and then reduce, I would sort of rarely use, um, especially after learning do call. And so I'll go into a brief example here. If you disagree, feel free to like leave a comment, but I don't see the point. Everybody's scratching herself. I'm not just gonna come over and hassle me. Um, and so let's start with a list object. That's where do call um, really shines. And random reduce is good for it too, um, in my opinion. <clears throat> and I think reduce has just more roots in sort of like functional programming. And I don't know. I don't go into anything like that. And so Brody's now erased my list. So I'll control Z that. Um, and so how do you use do call? Let's say we have a list of vectors of length 10 corresponding to values one through 10. And we wanted to take these vectors in a list and mash them down into a matrix. How you would do that, or that, there's two ways you could do that. There's many ways you could do that. Um, 
two ways that I know of are using do call, which basically makes a single um, a single call to R bind. So if we wanted to R bind them all down, so I'm sorry, I'm going to delete that structure call. So do call works by handing it first. So do call function, you hand it first the um, verb, sort of the action or function that you want to perform, and then the list object that you want to perform it all, perform it on. And so that is the output that we want. And what that output actually looks like would be the same thing as this. So we want to R bind, and it gives a single call to R bind that is basically just like a big old vectorized kind of vectorized call. So that's the same thing as do call in that situation. What reduce does is slightly different. And so we have our list here, and reduce iteratively adds, iteratively performs the function of um, that we hand it. Where is being crazy? It iteratively performs the function. Uh, the second element to the first, and then the third to the the resulting element that is done on the first and the second. So what that basically means is it's going to R bind two and one elements two and one together, giving us a, a two rows in the matrix, and then. And then it's going to R bind that third element of the list, which is a vector of one through 10, to the product that it's already done, right? Which is that, um, that two dimensional, or sorry, that two row matrix. Um, and so we would actually expect in this situation reduce to be much more computationally intensive um, and take longer than the single R bind call. And you can examine that using um, system time, which we haven't gone over, but we will go over line profiling and, and sort of writing efficient code, um, I think maybe two lectures from now. So now I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about the tidyverse, or relatively. We're only going to talk about two packages within the tidyverse. So the tidyverse is a ridiculous name for a web or is sometimes called an ecosystem of interconnected packages, all underlying, uh, all underlined, I guess, with the same idea, it's tidy data. Um, the reading this week and much of the discussion will focus on what is tidy data. I'm going to shift that and we're just going to focus on the computational tools for working with supposedly tidy data here. Um, yeah, and so Tidyverse includes many, 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 many packages of which we're only going to use plier and dplyr. So if you don't have those, you'll want to um, install them using the install packages command as I've listed in the RStudio workspace. And it'll go through and install plier and all its dependencies. I don't know why I installed that, I already have it, but it's okay. Now it's gonna do, there we go, it's done. And then we need to call those in using the library command. And so we say library plier and also library dplyr. And now we can view our session info and see what is, um, is now added into the global workspace as a function of, I am not even sharing my screen. I am talking to you like I'm sharing my screen. Not sharing the screen, gonna share my screen. All right, so now that I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to scroll back up. So I installed the package using the install packages command and then call them in using library. And so there's library plier and library dplyr. You have to call them in this order or it doesn't work, which is a fantastic bug. It's been around for a while. They had to have fixed it by now, but I'm still, you always got to call in plier before you call in dplyr. That's, that's a thing. So we can view session info. And you're gonna see information on operating system that I'm running, R version, which I think I'm actually, I should update R. I'm a couple months behind. Um, as well as what I'm using for my matrix algebra. Um, 
and then my attached base packages. And now I can see that I have attached dplyr version 1.0.0 and plyr version 1.8.6. So major version, minor version, patch in semantic versioning language. It's all separated by a dot. So major version one, minor version eight, patch six. And then we can also see the many things were loaded via the namespace, which are sort of depends or I guess they're suggests, right? Of dplyr or plyr. And there's a bunch of them, but they're not attached. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, this one is, that'll be piping later. This is for integration with C++. Uh, this is for using R6 objects, which we don't even go over. I think we might have briefly mentioned them, but I definitely didn't like go over their structure or anything like that. We got weird RStudio API, per for working with lists, tibble, which everything now will be a tibble, which I'll go into what a tibble is. All right. So these are the two really, really useful packages in my opinion. Or the, maybe the, um, that, there's other useful packages in the tidyverse. These are the two most useful packages in my opinion. Um, and so how well we're going to do to learn it is we're going to create some data and then we're going to um, explore the data. So the data we create is actually in a new format. I'm not sure why I chose this time to introduce this new format, but I'm going for it. I think this is adapted from Jenny Bryan's work um, or Jenny, Jenny Bryan's tutorial. I'm not sure about that. I think it is, or maybe from, from Javi's work. Hopefully I credit people when credit is due. So what I'm doing now is making an array. So an array is another sort of data structure <clears throat> that can be multidimensional. What I mean by multidimensional is that you can only really have um, a matrix or data frame that is two dimensional, has rows and columns. There's no third dimension or fourth dimension. An array can have more than that. So here I'm setting up a, a three dimensional array, each composed of three um, levels or entries. And so if you think about a cube that is three by three by three in terms of length and width and depth, that is the data that we're working with. And the data um, are values of one through 27. And so we can look at them and it sort of appears like a list, which is a good way to think about it, where each um, initial layer is a cut through the list sorry, cut through the three-dimensional array, like you would slice a cake. And then you have one level of that array. And that one level of the array is two dimensions. So what I mean by that is you can see this first level of the array in that third dimension, which is indexed using two commas. We can do it here. We have two commas now because we have three dimensions. Um, and we see we have that first slice of cake that first level of the array, values one through nine. If we did two, we would have values 10 through 18. And if we have our third slice, that's our tail end that only contains values 19 through 27. Now let's give it some, or, uh, some column names and row names. Brody's back, if you can tell by the shaking of the desk. Um, and so here we gave row names, which corresponds to dimension one. I think. No, but it's across dimensions. Okay, so it's Curry, the Curly, Larry, and Mo are row names. Cow names, top. Um, Groucho, Harpo, and Zeppo. I definitely didn't choose these. I totally took this from, I think, maybe Jenny Bryan's work. So I should be doing that. I'll, I'll definitely edit the notes to provide a, a link and maybe provide a link in the, um, in the description of this video. And then we also named the third dimension. We name it Bart, Lisa, and Maggie. And so that'll, that maybe helps us um, sort of conceptualize arrays better. So let's redo that thing where we have just that first slice. And so this should be the slice corresponding only to Bart, that first level of the array object. So it should have row names of Curry, Larry, and Mo, column names of Groucho, Harpo, and Zeppo, and it does. And so this corresponds to BART. 
if we would like to have it correspond to Lisa, it would be the second one. Can we hand it a, yeah, we can also hand it the name of the um, dimension name. And so we only wanted that one. Now you can also imagine a case where we only want to index one of these earlier things. And so if we only wanted to index um, sort of the, the like a vertical slice, it's hard to sort of conceptualize the 3D object. And so imagine like a Rubik's cube where we're just cutting out the front face and then we're cutting out the face after that and taking that two-dimensional layer. And now imagine instead of that, turning it, turn, either turning the Rubik's cube or just cutting it like this instead of like this. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, and so this would, if we wanted it to correspond to Harpo, that would correspond to Harpo, where we still have our row names of Larry, Curly, or sorry, Curly, Larry, and Mo, and I still have our column names of the third dimension to be Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, but this would all correspond to that column, that if we had our Rubik's Cube, that center column, rather than cutting off this face, we're cutting deep in that way. This is perhaps too much detail, but it's fine. Now we're gonna go into plier syntax, which doesn't just work on these silly arrays, but also works on list objects, or tons of other stuff, super useful. Um, and so here we apply the, uh, I should talk about apply statements before I talk, use the verb as if you know what it is. <coughs> so apply statements, we introduced them briefly in the R intro lecture, but I'll introduce them again. Um, so apply is really useful when you want to take a function and spread it across multiple across a dimension of something. So if you take out the list object and you want to apply a function to each element of the list object, you would use an apply statement instead of a for loop or in place of a for loop if you wanted to. In the case of this array, we're going to use it across, um, you can use it across different margins, they're called. And so we have a three dimensional array. So we could potentially use it across three different margins. Here, I'm going to specify, I'm gonna copy this over and then tell you about it. So here we make, we make sure that a apply is called from the package r plier. And you'll notice the syntax is slightly different. And so before we talked about apply statements that worked on margins, but it was a p p l y. Here, all of the apply family of statements in plier are specific to, I'm going to delete this, are specific to their input and output. What this means is that, um, so before we have apply and we handed it a margin um, and it gives the arguments there. Thank you, R Studio. It's all the pop ups and stuff. So, so nice, thank you. Um, but now let's say we, um, we want the output to be a list object and the input to be just a normal array object. And so the, the A, the, the first letter of the ply statement, so just think of it as like, oopsies, whoopsies. Think of it as X, Y, ply, where X corresponds to the structure of the input y corresponds to the desired structure of the output and ply r does its thing. So here if we want to, um, we have an array as an input and we want an array as an output, we would use a, a, ply. a as an input is an array, a as the output, it's an array, and then we hand it the array. We look across the first margin, which corresponds to rows, which should correspond to Curly, Larry, and Mo, and we take the sum. Yeah, so the output is we get all the entries or all the sums of the values for each of the rows corresponding to Curly, yeah, Curly Larry, and Mo. Um, if we did this over the second, um, margin or second dimension, it would correspond to the sum of Groucho, Harpo, and Zeppo. And we see it does. We can also take the third dimension or the third margin, and it should correspond to sums for Bart, Lisa, and Maggie. 
and we see that it does. Uh, yeah, okay. So I also decided, yeah, this is good because now this, this is a really, really nice syntax in that it allows us to um, specify what structure we want our, our output in. And so you may at this point be like, arrays are stupid. I hate arrays. I'm never going to use an array. I'll just use a list, which I am totally like, that's fine. That's completely cool. <laughs> All right. So you may want to, to sort of mash the output of this rather than being an array. It's just an array of measures of one row, one dimensional measures. Um, you may want to bash that into something that um, is easier to work with. So sometimes data frames are easier to work with. And for that, we can use the, we can just separate, copy it over. <clears throat> we can say a D ply. So here the A means we're handing an array. The D means we want back a data frame. And the other sort of um, the character that we can use here is L if we want a list back. But here, let's, let's do D first. This is going to result in a data frame across margin. And so it's the same thing as before. We handed it the margin one, and now we're specifying the margins, which is the same thing as before. I was just, uh, I guess, lazy and didn't specify exactly what I meant in terms of argument. And then we hand it the dot fun, which is the function, which corresponds directly to what was given it before. Um, I might fix that in the lecture notes um, later, but just know that that's what that means. And then we can also see it in terms of outputting a list where it's going to output a list of three elements, each corresponding to, uh, and it'll be a named list. So each uh, list element will be named Curly, Larry, and Mo, and then it will give a vector of length one uh, value for each one. Yeah, so here's the labels down here, attributes put labels, and there are the sums as a list object. And then we can sort of do the same thing we did before in terms of looking across the different margins. So looking across that second margin, it should correspond to call names. So it should correspond to Groucho, Harpo, and Zeppo, and it does. And then we look across that third margin, which is Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, and we see that the sums correspond to that. Um, and in this, I sort of already went over the use of a L ply to get the output as a list object. Sometimes you want a list object because you'd want to do something else to it or you needed a list object. A lot of these decisions in terms of what you'd want as an output are based on your personal um, preferences in terms of how you want to and, when, and what you're doing downstream. Um, so it's, it's easy for plotting if you ended up with a data frame. And so that might be the goal in the end. However, in terms of intermediate steps, you may need a list object. Um, tibbles are nice. I don't think I go into tibbles much, but I'll make a brief, a brief plug for them. Tibbles are nice in that column. It's a data frame, essentially. Tibble is a data frame. But each column can be a list of elements which is hard to wrap your brain around at first when it's just said. And I won't go into too much detail about that, but let's say, um, <clears throat> so some of my work is on ecological networks. And so if I stored an entire network, um, I have a network of something per country, let's say. And so here it's hard to match up networks to countries. I can have a named list for each list element corresponds to a network object and it is named by country, completely fine. But if I had other things that I want, like country level attributes, like population density or um, some other thing that I would care about, um, you can have that network list be a column in a table. And therefore you can index it like a data frame, but have access to more complex information than you would in a standard data frame where each thing has to correspond to sort of a single value. All of a sudden, 
one row can actually contain a column that doesn't just output one single value, but it outputs a vector of values or a polygon or a network or some other specialized R structure. Useful. I'll give them that. It's useful. Uh, also, there's a lot of um, things that have built on sort of apply and that sort of statement. So they're actually really, really useful to learn as we'll go into in, um, in later lectures about parallel computing. Some of the same syntax, I'm going to highlight it down here if you can read that. Some of the same syntax, syntax that is used in writing apply statements is directly transferable over to operating across multiple cores and writing parallel code, which is incredibly, incredibly useful. Okay, so that's basically like the background and the backbone of like a lot of the applier functionality in my mind. A lot of it really boils down to those apply statements. Um, there are, there's tons of other functionality in the package, but for the sake of this lecture, let's keep it at the sort of um, fancy apply statements, if we can call them that. And so now we'll go into a little bit about dplyr statements. And the reason I'm focusing more on dplyr is that dplyr is more about data manipulation than plyr is, in my opinion. And it has the syntax rooted pretty firmly in, uh, in understandable things and in um, sort of like SQL type formatting. So let, let's, I'm just going to do by example. So let's make a data frame. We have a data frame that corresponds to three variables, A, B, and D, two of which, A and B, are random draws from a uniform distribution of length 100, and then D is uh, a random uh, uniform, or uh, sorry, a random uh, normal variant um, of, with mean one and standard deviation one. Sorry, variance one. Um, so we can see the head of this. Nice. Uh, so let's say we want um, to rename the columns. So the columns are currently in A, B, D capital letters. Let's say we want to make them lowercase letters. We could use the rename function in dplyr where we first hand it, excuse me, the data frame object, and then we specify the old, or sorry, the new name followed by the old name. And now we can look at our, now we have an object called df2 and we can look at the head of df2 and it is different. This is the exact same thing as something like this. So I have specified call names df2 and I say abd. It's also the exact same thing as using this. So two lower is a base function. I think it's in the utils package um, that converts a character string all to lowercase. So that's the same thing. We're getting there via multiple routes. Um, same thing as the next one. So now we'll also go into uh, select. And so we've, we've briefly mentioned select before in terms of the, <clears throat> the subset argument for data formatting in, in just a little bit ago. But now we're going to talk about it in terms of uh, the dplyr syntax, which is strikingly familiar. And so here we just have a verb or function called select. We hand it our data frame, df2, and we hand it the column, not in character strings. We just give it the column name. And it can pull that out for us and format it as a data frame object. Useful. It also allows for sort of fuzzy matching. So if you say obs and starts with, so the starts with function A. So what if I had columns named apple and aardvark and then a bunch of other columns and for some reason I wanted to pull out those two A columns. I wanted to see apple and I wanted to see aardvark. I could use starts with to subset multiple columns based on that condition um, of starting with A. However, you can also select columns as I've shown before. So we instead of df, we can say df2a, df2a, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
where this starts mattering or where this starts being maybe more useful in terms of the package functionality is in the filter statement. So this is very, very similar to the subset date statement where you scratch your face, you don't do that. I think she just wants to be in the video. So we'll bring her back and put her in the video. This is the Brody cat. She's still licking herself. I'm gonna set her back down. Uh, and so we have the, she's gonna hop over here and hassle me. So we have a filter statement, pretty much the same thing as a subset statement. I'm gonna copy and paste it over here. All right, so this is going to filter. Filter meaning row wise. And so, um, so select is basically column wise, right? And we want to select only the columns. You can't use select on rows. Filter filters out things based on a condition of a column such that it filters rows. If that doesn't make sense, think about it practically. We pulled the values of A, of column A, from a uh, random uniform distribution, which means that half the data should be contained, or half the data should uh, arguably be less than 0.5 and the other half should be greater than 0.5. And if we want to filter all those values that are less than 0.5, we can use the filter command as entered into RStudio here. And I have it first the data frame and then second the conditional argument, right? And so this is the same thing as before when I went over the subset statement or when I used which. And so we're just gonna sit on the keyboard. So we can look at that and it has Look at the dim, it should be around 50, 53. So it's 53 values that, that sort of meet this thing as A being less than 0.5. This is the same syntax as saying DF2, which DF2 A less than 0 0.5, specify that it's operating on rows. And then we can see that by really sitting on the, my hands on the keyboard specifying the gym, and we see it's 53 rows and three columns. Um, we'll see if we can just hold her and, and do that one hand typing. This is the education you're getting. This is me trying to record lectures from home because people don't wear masks. All right, I'm gonna set her down. Okay, move the kitty cat. All right, so the next uh, sort of deep flyer verb that I want to go over is the mutate argument. Uh, mutate is used when you want to create a new column. And so you can specify new columns on data frames, not matrices, but only data frames, by just calling them something new, right? So DF2 has three columns, say A, B, and D, lowercase. Let's say I want to make a column E. I can just hand it a new variable E, as long as it's the same size as the number of rows in DF2, and I've just created a new column. So we, when we look at DF2, it now has four columns, when before it had three. This is also useful for um, removing a column. Let's say you have an intermediate product where you don't want it to be there um, in sort of the workflow. You can either use select and select the columns that you do want, or you can make sure that a column is not there by setting it to null if it's a data frame. Not, this doesn't work in matrices. Uh, so let's say df2e store as null. Enter, and now we look at the head, the first six lines of df2, and we notice that column that we just made is now gone. So mutate works like this, and then the example, um, I give a, a sort of maybe more informative use of uh, mutate, which is you hand it, <clears throat> aspects of DF2 originally. So let's say E is actually this derived quantity of A plus B divided by D. This will happen a lot. Like you'll, yeah, way more than I expected, I guess, but I don't know what I expected when I was first learning. Um, and so we can see that now we have a new column and then I answered it in the wrong. We have a new column that corresponds, it's called E and it corresponds to the value of A plus B divided by D. I talk a little bit about right in place. I actually don't really want to go over that now. I've gone over it in previous lectures about right in place in R. Um, I might even just delete that 
section in the, in the notes or change that section in the notes. Um, and just keep it going over the verbs and going over the usage um, to sort of focus on the data manipulation aspects. So there are two more functions before we hit joins, which is a good time. Uh, and those two functions are group by and summarize, often used in conjunction. Um, and so let's say we want to subset the data by country and then calculate some aspect of um, that country. So let's say we wanted to calculate the mean life expectancy per country. We could write a for loop and subset the data by country and then take the mean value and append it to a vector. That would be one approach. That would use all base features, completely cool. Um, what else could you do? I think in base there's functionality to create a list object and maybe in subset, I'm not sure. And then you can apply over that list object. So if you were able to get a list object of each country as a separate list object, and then you could just apply over that list object using L apply to calculate the mean of life expectancy. In dplyr syntax, how this would work is you use group by. Group by, which I'm showing here, oops. Um, you give it first the data frame and then the what you want to group by. So we want to group by a country. And what this is going to return is actually pretty much the same thing. It's going to return a table, but it's not going to look as if like uh, you actually separated out the different countries. And, th and so group by doesn't really do much to the actual raw data in, in, in the deep layer syntax. Um, how it works, nice, uh, how it actually works is when you go to act on the, the division that you've made or the group by that you've made. And you can do that being, using summarize. So summarize is basically a way to apply a function across different um, grouping levels of data. So here we want to apply a function that finds the mean life expectancy for each country. So we've already grouped by country and now we can use the summarize function to this new table that we created, but just treat it like a data frame or treat it like a table, you do you. Uh, and then we create a new variable called MN, so for mean life. And then we hand it the actual thing that we want to calculate, the mean life expectancy. And we can hand it more than one thing. So I don't think summarize expects just one thing. We can look into that. So it, in this app, it's a, another table corresponding to each grouping factor. Um, which is country, and then the mean life expectancy per country. If we also wanted to calculate the standard deviation, this could actually be wrong, but let's see if this works, where we just handed a second argument corresponding to standard deviation. Oh, it worked. All right. Standard deviation of life expectancy, and now we have a three-column table. So summarize is actually really, really useful, especially when you return um, not just one column, but you want to act on things like getting the mean and standard deviation across grouping levels. The last thing that I'm going to talk about, or the second to last thing, are joins. <clears throat> joins are useful when you have relational data. We won't go into what that means really, but relational data are essentially nested data that are connected by an index. Imagine you have a situation <clears throat> And sorry to think of just a random relational data thing. You have a data frame of grocery stores and their spatial locations and their sizes. And so there are different, there's like things about a grocery store. Um, and then there's, you have a separate data frame that has the, the index of a grocery store also with information about what's contained within the grocery store. Like this grocery store has apples, this grocery store has bananas. Yeah, there's multiple ways you can see that. I'm not even sure that's a great example. I think the example, what is the example I give in the notes? Uh, 
uh, oh, it's spatial observations of a species um, you know, across a landscape, and then trying to relate that back to species trait data, right? So if you have a data frame corresponding to species occurrence data, you have species represented multiple times. So species are not unique in the data frame. But species traits are unique. And so you'd, if you enter in them, them into a single data frame, you'd repeat a bunch of data, right? Which is not ideal. Um, so that maybe makes more sense than a grocery store example. I don't know. Either way, hopefully that makes sense. If not, we can go over that more in um, the Zoom meeting. Uh, and then people who are watching this online, bless you, but I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. <laughs> so hopefully it makes sense once you learn or look at the lecture notes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So now we have, let's modify our, uh, our DF. So we still have this data frame called DF, typing around my cat's legs, consisting of A, columns A, B, and D. And let's say we want now want to uh, put in a, a species column. So we now see the head of DF, and it corresponds to a species of a random draw of this vector of like three cat, dog, and bird. So basically, just, I use sample function to sample the vector randomly a hundred times. So if we look at table, each one of those should appear right around thirty-three times because each one has an equal probability of being sampled. And you see it's about equal, it's close enough. Yeah, 31, 32, and 37. Um, oh, and then we want a sec second thing. And so our second data frame is information about the species. So it is a unique data frame. Oh, how did I mess that up? All right, I think I just copied it over on. All right, so let's see. This is a data frame of characteristics of each of the things, dog, cat, bird, and snake. It gives how annoying they are on a scale from one to 100 and their mean body size in some meaningless quantity. So birds are the most annoying. Cats are listed as not very annoying, but I think now I would probably bump that up. So let's go ahead and change that and say info. This is what you're doing to me, Brody. And so we index the vector annoying, and we can either hard code it using the two, which means index two, or we can specify it corresponds to the row cat, which is a little bit janky. That's actually not really the way to do it. I don't know which would be like the most ideal way to do it. Probably, I would probably do this. Let's see, no, oh, that's not right. Is it because it's treating as a table? I don't know. Basically, the second row in the first, or sorry, the second row in the second column of that. I think it is just a bad way to index. So that's my bad. Um, so that first way actually might have been better using info, annoying, and then just specifying the second value. Or you can say like which species equal cat if you wanted to be weird. So basically, this is just a way that you can. It's a way to say that you can do a lot of different ways to index things. And so that corresponds to two before, and let's just ramp that up to right around 65. All right, so now we have our info. Let me see, now we change the value because we're already annoying. Um, and so joins are useful basically to mash these two forms of data together. So let's say, <clears throat> we want to know, we want to have that annoying column or mean body size column right alongside that, oops, that DF column or that DF data frame, which correspond, which has a species component. We can do that using joins. Joins are inherited from SQL or SQL. Um, and there are a few main types of joins that I'll go over. Brody's now typing for me. That's it makes me want to move her annoying score even higher. There's full join, there is anti-join, there is left join, and there is right join. The most used one that I have found incredibly useful is left join. 
The difference between, okay, so full join is a way to, you have some index column, which you want to compare between the two data frames. Here, it would be species. We know species in um, the DF, oops, sorry, in DF corresponds to this column. And we know that the info column also has a column named species, that we want this information on level of annoyingness, annoyance, and mean body size sort of mashed in. But how do you match it in, right? And so full join would join all instances of species across both data frame and info. And so here you notice that, um, so all data are represented in the join from both info and from DF. But info has, has that line about a snake, but, but snake never appears in, um, in our uh, DF object. Only the first three elements, only dog, cat, and bird appear. But here with a full join, it considers snake and it puts snake in there and gives all the values um, of NA for that original DF object. But here's why left join or right join are really nice, is that they maintain the structure of the first thing in the case of a left join that you hand to it. Here's what that means. Pretty zombie, just killing me. All right, so when we hand, we before we can, you know, all right. Um, so full join is agnostic toward the, uh, the order of, of things that we hand it. It would hand, it would give this or ish, um, regardless of what I gave it. Left join is different. So left join, the first argument, df, we know that the output of this join is going to be of dimensions of df, or at least number of rows. It's just going to have appended columns. And now we see no longer is that snake column included because snake doesn't occur in our df data frame. So if we see the dim of this left join, we see it's 100 by 6. And if we see the dim of df, it's 100 by 4. So all it did was add those two columns corresponding to how annoying the thing is, pointing at the cat, um, and the mean body size into that data frame. Um, the right join does something uh, basically similar, but in here, because we hand it that info second, it's going to include the info, um, all entries of the info data frame into things. So it's going to actually going to be 101 rows, and that extra one row is going to correspond to the snake, which has no values in DF associated with it. Um, so left join, I find to be the most useful. We can also consider the, oops, we can also consider the right join of info by DF. Hey, what would that look like? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I was just like messing myself up for a second. That would be the same thing. Yeah, that would be the same thing, but in just like a slightly different structure as the um, left join DF and info. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going crazy. Um, lastly, stop scratching yourself. Lastly, we can do scratch yourself. We can do an anti join. Anti joins are things that are not shared between the two um, data frame objects, and so. If we do an anti-join of info and df by that index column species, it should only be one row corresponding to the snake. That's the one oddball that doesn't appear. So it appears in info and doesn't appear in df. And there's also other forms of joins, but I feel like those are the, the sort of clearest. Um, lastly, and really briefly, I'll go over the idea of piping. So we went over the idea of piping first introduced in uh, the terminal. Um, and so there the pipe is that just a, a vertical bar. Piping in the dplyr syntax is slightly different and is incorporated using this mag magrid r magrid or I don't know um, symbol which is the percent sign 
greater than, and then the percent sign again. There's different sort of variations on this, which I won't go into. I'm just going to focus on this one, which is just sort of the standard pipe. How this is useful, sort of remember before where we first grouped by, oops, we first grouped by country, and then we operated on that data frame that is grouped by, and you summarize on that, and that's a little bit clunky. Um, and so group, or sorry, and so piping allows us to hand intermediate data products to the next function. <clears throat> so here, and so the first thing, I use that piping symbol. I say, pi take dat, take this dat object and hand it to, that's the, what piping does. So take whatever this is and push it forward through the process. And so I hit the pipe and then it wants more. And so I say, what's the next step in the pipe? The next step is to group by country, but then I still end with the piping symbol. And so I say, what's the next step in the pipe? And I hand it that same syntax, but now I don't have to hand it the data frame like I did before. And it does the same thing. And so temp three, over the cat, should be the same structure as uh, what I called temp two before. And it is. And so it's really useful um, on top of the sort of dplyr syntax for chaining commands together. I think that's it. And so hopefully I'm not over time too much. And thank you for listening. Brody is bowing. Thank you for being a good support, Brody. Thank you.